so now in physics up to 10th class 9th class and 10th class you might have studied quantities without worrying about their direction much right do you know the distinction between scalar quantities and vector quantities right so you know the distinction between them so we know that uh, you know scalar quantities are the quantities which have got magnitude and vector quantities are the ones which have got magnitude and direction i think you are already familiar with that can anyone give me examples of five scalars and five vector quantities without googling it out or anything because nowadays it is just easy to hit all tab and start searching for answers i don't want that sir <clears throat> uh, yeah scalar velocity speed scalar speed is a scalar okay so is time a scalar also pardon time time is a scalar okay and any other scalar quantities think about it this way when you go to purchase milk right to a supermarket or if milk vendor comes to your house to give milk does he give you milk let us say 1 liter can or a 2 liter can or does he give you milk in 2 liter can facing north direction or 3 liters facing southwest direction do they mention the direction while giving you milk no no, no right so volume is also a scalar then if you are running your uh, pardon distance says distance right distance is another one and area area but then we'll put a star here it's a very strange quantity i'll come back to this later on right but area will do fine and when you look around there is an ac running in your room i believe right and that ac will have a temperature measurement that is seen on the display there let us say 20 degree centigrade 24 degree centigrade now does that depend on direction 20 degrees north 23 degrees south no right no. it is just 23 degrees centigrade therefore temperature so current when you current very good but then again i'll put a star here for a different reason okay so current is a scalar quantity or let us believe that it's a scalar quantity as of now and anything else that you can think of i i i suspect you have got this word current from a chapter which might have been there in your 10th class there was a current electricity chapter there so there would be some other quantities also in that same chapter power power yes is a scalar and potential difference potential difference yes and because and there was one law ah there was a law which was connecting all three of them the moment you say current the other two quantities should immediately come into picture resistance so we see we have listed out so many scalar quantities of course there are more there is density there is mass right but then this is good enough for a beginning and we will soon look into area and current later on in detail but before we proceed let us list out as many vector quantities as possible again you people can take the lead and initiate the discussion give us the list of vector quantities velocity velocity okay velocity is a vector quantity force displacement force is a vector quantity displacement is a vector quantity and actually we could start with displacement and then write velocity here right this would be a better sequence and in that case we can drag this a little bit down because displacement if it is a vector quantity then because it's a vector quantity velocity becomes a vector because velocity is a vector quantity then the next one acceleration becomes a vector quantity 
Because acceleration is a vector quantity, we know that F is equal to MA. Therefore, force becomes a vector quantity. Right? Any other vector quantities that you come across that you have? Okay. So weight. Weight. Shall I write this? No, sir. No, not this one, right? <laughs> a different weight. Okay. Uh, sir, is magnetism considered vector quantity also? Uh, let us put it this way. What is magnetism? Okay, let your friends answer. Like Rakshita has put forward a question. Can we treat magnetism as vector? And you are free to answer. Prithviraj, Ayush, Abdul, anyone. Shall I tell you what? Magnetism, it is neither a scalar nor a vector. You know why? Because it is just the name of a chapter. Magnetism is a phenomenon. Then because of magnetism, you have magnetic field, magnetic moment, right? Magnetic force. But what is magnetism? Magnetism is just a property. That's okay, so, can we, uh, so can we club magnetism as a vector or a scalar? No. Any quantity associated with magnetism? Yes, probably we can analyze that. So yes, any yes. other quantity? It's a magnetic field is a vector. Magnetic field is a vector quantity. And we indicate it as B bar. If magnetic field is a vector, you can immediately think of another field, electric field. Because it is a combination of magnetic field and electric field that makes electromagnetic waves, right? Isn't it? Right. So we are able to figure out a few scalar quantities. We are able to figure out a few vector quantities. Now, can any one of you define what a vector quantity is? The vector quantity has both magnitude and direction. Right. Vector quantity has got both magnitude and direction. The remaining three of you, Ayush, Prithviraj, and Rakshit, you agree to that or you want to add something or you want to delete something from that sentence? Think about it. Awesome. Everything is fine. Vector yes, quantity has got magnitude and direction. Right. So now, let me ask you this question. There is a cell which is connected to a resistance like this. The cell is of 10 volts. Okay. And the resistance is also of 10 ohms. How much is the current flowing in the circuit? From your 10th class knowledge, do you know this? How much is the current? One, 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 one. one ampere. Yeah, one ampere, not a big deal, one ampere. And I don't know whether you are very familiar with uh, Zoom settings or not. At least in the latest version, you can use the space bar to unmute yourself. So you don't have to run to the mouse every time to check mute, unmute. And uh, as long as the space bar is pressed, it will remain unmute. The moment you remove your hand from the space bar, it will become muted. Again. That is one facility. I don't know. You have to activate that in the settings. If you can do that, that will be wonderful then you don't have to run around with the mouse for that. Newton, right? Check that. Okay. So the current is one ampere. So can I draw this current like this, starting from the positive terminal through the resistance and going back to the negative terminal? I can write it like this. Yes. Now my question is, the current has got a magnitude of one ampere and it very clearly has a direction from positive coming down, going through the resistance and entering into the negative terminal. Would it be correct if I draw current like this? No, right? I cannot do that. So if current has got magnitude and direction, then why should I call it as a scalar point? So Isn't because, it? Sir, I see I not mention it while, while seeing. Sorry. Pardon? Sir, as like while saying, if it's uh, while saying one ampere, we are not mentioning it is. Uh, no yeah, in, in that case, when we say one ampere, we are not mentioning the direction. The same thing is valid for velocity also. Suppose a body is moving with 20 meters per second in the north direction, and I choose not to mention north direction, then does it become a scalar suddenly? No, right? North direction yeah. is still there, but probably we are not mentioning it. And that is sometimes called as magnitude of a vector. So you don't have to mention the direction of the vector. 
But still, as you people rightly pointed out, current is a scalar quantity and the reason for that is this. Suppose I take a wire in which there is six amperes of current and here there is a junction. There is one wire going here, one wire going here. Suppose this wire carries off two amperes of current, then how much current do you think will be flowing in this wire? Four. Four, absolutely correct. Same situation, six amperes. This is the junction, one wire going up, one wire going down. Here, it is two amperes. Now, what will be the current here? Don't think too much about it. Whatever you get first up, you tell me that. Four amperes. Four amperes, right? Absolutely correct. So did the current that is flowing in these two wires, did it depend on this angle theta or this angle theta here? Did it depend on that? No, sir. No. Right? Therefore, vector quantities are quantities which have magnitude and direction. Correct. Sometimes scalar quantities also you may associate some direction like in case of current. Therefore, the full definition of vectors is vectors are the quantities which have magnitude, which have direction and they follow vector laws of addition. Therefore, this one becomes very important. Because if you don't add this to the statement, then does current have a magnitude? Yes. Does it have a direction? Yes. Positive to negative. But still you can't call it as a vector. The reason is because the distribution of current doesn't depend on theta. So it doesn't follow vector laws of addition. What are vector laws of addition? We'll come to that later on. Right? There is a parallelogram law. There is a triangle law. There is a polygon law. Right? We will learn about all that later. But at least you must remember that Vectors are the quantities which have magnitude, which have direction, and they follow vector laws of addition. Then those quantities are called vector quantities. Okay. Then we need to learn a lot about vector quantities and we need to learn some basic mathematics before we get into anything significant in 11th class in 12th class. So let me first ask you, do you know how to denote a vector in a text format and in a diagram format? There are two notations for a vector. In a text format, how do you indicate it? In a diagram format, how do you indicate it? Are you aware of that already from your lower classes? No. Okay. In a text format, suppose you want to say velocity is a vector, then you indicate V, put a bar on it. If you want to say acceleration is a vector, write an A, put a bar on it. If you want to say force is a vector, write F, put a bar on it. So what is the moral of the story? Whenever you want to indicate a vector, use the symbol, but make sure that you put a bar on it. That is one way of writing it. In textbooks, you won't see these bars because when you are typing something, then writing a letter and putting a bar on that, it is you know, very cumbersome. It's not very convenient. So in textbooks, if they want to indicate velocity, they'll indicate velocity like this. Do you see the difference between the above V and this one? This is called bold face letter. This is a normal letter. If they want to indicate acceleration, they'll indicate acceleration like this with a very thick font. If they want to indicate force, they'll indicate force like this. Now, even when you try it yourself, you will realize that for handwriting, this one is convenient and for typing, this one is convenient. So both the notations are pretty frequently used. Do you know how to use Microsoft Word or PPT? Have you ever used that? There, if you want to indicate a letter with a bold, you just type the letter, select it, and you say control B, right? And it becomes bold easily. Have you ever tried putting a bar on some letter? You can try that later on after the class. And you'll realize how difficult it is. You will need a mathematics equation editor for that. Therefore, while writing, continuously keeping designing like this, it's a very big headache. Therefore, we don't follow this format. We just follow V bar or A bar. But while typing, then this is more convenient. Both of them are equally valid. In some old textbooks, if you come across, then vectors are indicated like this V with an arrow mark or acceleration with an arrow mark or force with an arrow mark. But this is an old notation. Nowadays, we don't use it much. You know, what was the headache with that notation? Some people 
who did not know enough science, they ended up thinking that if there is a vector velocity with an arrow mark like this, they ended up believing that the body is going towards right hand side. Why? Because there is an arrow here. But that was not the idea. The idea was only to indicate that it's a vector quantity. If that is the case, how will you indicate velocity of a body which is going up? Should you indicate it like this? Velocity of a body which is going down, should you indicate it like this? Then the entire textbook will look full of designs like this. Therefore, that was not the idea at all. Then they thought that, okay, having arrow was a bit confusing. Therefore, they dropped that arrow format. And presently, we just say any symbol with a bar on that means it's a vector. But having understood that, there is much more here. Sometimes you are interested both in magnitude and the direction of the vector, then you can indicate V with a bar. It means I'm interested both in magnitude and direction. Suppose in solving a problem, you know that velocity is a vector, but in that particular context, you are interested only in finding the magnitude of the vector. That is possible, right? Sometimes you are not interested in the direction. You want to know how fast is the body going. Then how do you indicate that? That is indicated by writing that symbol within mod like this. This means you are interested only in magnitude of the vector. You are not interested in which direction it is going. That is what it means. Okay. Similarly, there are situations where you are interested only in the direction of the vector. You are not interested in the magnitude. Like suppose you know that the body is going to go at 200 meters per second in any case. But you want to know, is it going in the north direction or is it going in the south direction or east or west or whatever? You are not interested in the magnitude. You are interested only in the direction. In that case, you use the symbol and put a cap here. This is literally called as a cap, like a topi. Right? That is a cap. So this means you are interested only in the direction. And if you are interested only in the direction, this kind of a special vector, which gives us only the direction, that is also called unit vector. So this is a complete vector, gives both magnitude and direction. If you are interested only in the magnitude, you write it like this. If you are interested only in the direction, then you write it like this. Is this clear? Right. So this is the way we write vectors. Like if you want to write an equation, then the way you have to write it is, see, you might be familiar with this equation, right? F is equal to MA, force is equal to mass into acceleration. Then if you want to indicate the vector nature of it, you just have to put a bar and bar. It means a force that is properly applied with certain magnitude, certain direction will give rise to acceleration of certain magnitude in that certain direction. That is the meaning conveyed by this image. Okay. But then diagrammatically also, we must know how to indicate a vector. So a vector is always indicated by a directed line segment. Directed line segment is a very official English phrase for that. In a very loose language, sometimes we say a uh, vector is indicated by an arrow. And arrow is very frequently used because even teachers are lazy, just like students. Oh, what? What happened to Prithviraj? Is it that only I am not able to see or anyone, no one is able to see Prithviraj? Prithviraj, Hajar Ho, <laughs> where are you, man? <laughs> no one is able to see Prithviraj, right? Yeah, now a little bit of hair has cropped up. But he has to adjust, you have to adjust your camera, really, Prithviraj. Because I need to see my students. Without seeing my students, it is just like teaching my laptop. Hmm? So at least by next class, okay, Prithviraj, will you get your camera ready by the next class? Ah, right, because I need to see that. Okay, so a vector is indicated by what is called as a directed line segment, right? Vector is indicated by what is called as a directed line segment, but this is a very lengthy phrase and the teachers are also lazy, students are also lazy. So we generally don't use such a big phrase. We just say a vector is indicated by an arrow, finish. But remember that using the word arrow is just an informal way of saying that. If, if you are giving really a talk or a presentation, then you should say, this is the vector indicated by this directed line segment. You should use that phrase. Otherwise, for mutual discussion with your friends and us, and then you can just say arrow and that will be fine. Okay. Then there are two aspects to it. In which direction should the arrow be pointing? If the vector is pointing upwards, like you're throwing a stone upwards, then the velocity should be indicated like this. If the body is coming down, then you can indicate the vector like this. 
If the force is applied in the right hand side direction, you can indicate it like this. If the force is applied in the left hand side direction, you can indicate it like this. So basically, in a diagrammatic notation, a vector should be indicated exactly with a directed line segment in the direction in which the quantity is present. If a quantity is in the downward direction, you can't indicate that with the arrow in the upward direction. For a textual notation, you just indicate a bar. But for a diagrammatic notation, the arrow should represent the direction in which the vector is present. Okay, is it clear? Then there is another importance attached to the length of the vector. Suppose you can draw a velocity like this, you can draw a velocity like this, you can draw a velocity like this also. From this, do you get an idea? If I call this as V1 bar, V2 bar, V3 bar, can you guess which velocity is the largest just by looking at the diagrams? Yes, which, we, yeah, V3 is the largest, right? So isn't it just plain common sense to indicate a larger vector with a larger arrow and a smaller vector with a smaller arrow? That's these are the two attributes of vector quantities. Got it? The direction directly using the directed line segment and the length of the directed se line segment is decided by what is the magnitude of the vector. The larger the magnitude, the more will be the, I mean, the longer will be the line, smaller the magnitude, smaller will be the line. Okay. Now, let us see how to add vectors. Now the question is, why do we even need to understand addition of vectors? Suppose a body starts here, it goes up to this point, then it goes up like this, then it goes here like this, then it goes here like this, and then it comes here like this. If someone says, what is the shortest distance between the initial position and the final position? What is the shortest distance? This one, right? Yes, sir. But this one has come because the body first traveled like this, then it traveled like this, and then like this, and then like this, and then finally like this. So this is displacement S1. This is displacement S2. This is S3. This is S4. This is S5. When you add all these displacements, you get the resultant displacement. So isn't this a clear-cut case? where we know that, yes, we must know addition of vectors, otherwise we won't be able to solve the problem. Right? Just to give you a simple example, because any time we learn a mathematical tool or something in physics, we must know why we are doing that. So is there a necessity to understand how vectors are to be added? Yes, there is a necessity and this is a clear cut example. Likewise, velocities can be added, forces can be added. Suppose there is a body like this, one person is pulling it in this direction, 20 newtons, in the right-hand side direction. So in which direction will the body go? Right-hand side direction, isn't it? Suppose another person is pulling it equally. Okay, let me draw it a bit more accurately. This is the body. And let me draw one arrow towards the right-hand side. This is one force of 20 newtons. This is another force of 20 newtons. So can you tell me where will the body go now? This is 20 newtons, this is 20 newtons. So it will go nowhere. It will go nowhere, there. right? Isn't it? Right. Now, suppose I choose the other force in this direction. And this force is also exactly 20 newtons. This is 20 newtons, this is 20 newtons. Now tell me, will the body go in the direction of force A? or will it go in the direction of force B, or will it go in some other direction? So some other direction. Some other direction. How do we find that direction? By adding these two, right? Because both these forces are acting on the body, isn't it? So this again is an example for us to understand that yes, we must know how to add vectors. Without adding vectors, we won't be able to solve. Roughly, can you guess in which direction the body will go? So between A and B. Between A and B, right? Exactly that is what you get even when you add the vectors. I'll tell you how to do that. You draw a line parallel to A like this. 
but then bring that line to the tip of P. This is one thing. Then you draw a line parallel to P like this, but bring it to the tip of A. Now see where these two lines have met each other. From the common point where these forces were acting, you draw it exactly up to this. So this now indicates the direction of the resultant force and therefore the body will move like this. Did you understand this? Yes, sir. We have drawn this line parallel to vector A and we have drawn this line parallel to vector B. What is it that we have drawn? We have drawn parallels. Okay, remember that name. What did we draw? Par parallels. Therefore, this approach is called parallelogram law of addition of vectors. Got it? This is called parallelogram law of addition of vectors because we are drawing a vector parallel to A, we are drawing a vector parallel to B. So does it mean that there is another method? Yes, of course. There is another method called triangle law of addition of vectors. There is another method called polygon law of addition of vectors. But let us first understand this parallelogram law of addition of vectors. I am not giving you any official statement for that and all that. We will come to that later on. Let us understand the context. Let us understand the, you know, the reason behind it and then we will come to the official statements. Suppose there is one vector like this and there is another vector like this. Okay, and your job is to add these two vectors. This is vector A and okay, let me use with a bar itself. A bar and this is another vector B bar. If we want to add them using parallelogram law, then how should we do it? First of all, we must construct a parallelogram out of it. Are these vectors even joining each other? No, sir. No, right? So our first job is to make them join each other. Let us draw A here and let us bring B here. Isn't it slightly better than what it was earlier? Earlier the vectors were very far away. Did I change the magnitude of B? No. no sir. Did I change the direction of B? No. no. Sir, I no. just moved B from its initial position to a new position. Remember, you are always free to move the vectors here and there. But what you should not do is either change their direction or change their magnitude. These two things should not be done. Without disturbing the magnitude and direction, you can move the vectors wherever you want. Now, since the name is parallelogram law of addition of vectors, I must draw a vector parallel to A or draw a line parallel to A. So draw a line parallel to A, but make sure that it touches the tip of B like this. Now draw a line parallel to B like this and make sure that it touches the tip of A. Yes. Now you see where these two parallels meet. These two parallels meet at this point. So from the point where these two vectors started to the point where these two parallels meet, this is the magnitude and the direction of the resultant vector. Is this idea clear? How to add two vectors? Yes, sir. Now, in your notebooks right now. Take any two vectors in, in the directions that you want. So can you take really vectors like this? This is one vector, this is another vector. Theoretically speaking, you can take it. But will you be able to complete a parallelogram with uh, just two parallel lines like this? No, right? So avoid this. Another thing to be avoided is taking one vector like this and another vector like this. Will you be able to complete a parallelogram? No. No, no. So, Excluding these two cases, choose any two vectors in whichever direction you want and try to complete parallel curves. Do at least three examples in your notebooks and convince yourself that you have understood how to do it. I'll give you five minutes time, just do it. So if the magnitude of vector B and vector A are different, 
still can lobby for those? Yes. Shall I give you an example for that? Let us take this is A. Evidently, you see that it is very large. And this is B. You can see that B is very small. All that we have to do is to draw parallels and the job is done. This is parallel to A and this is parallel to B. I'll bring this parallel to B near the tip of A and I'll bring the parallel to A near O. Here, near the tip of B. So where do these two parallels meet? They meet here. Therefore, the resultant is drawn from the point from where both the vectors were drawn to the point where the parallels meet. That's it. So this proves it, right? So vector A and vector B can be definitely of different size, different magnitude. And should the angle between A and B be less than 90 degrees? There is no rule like that. You can really try it out yourself by taking any two directions. That is the reason why I'm asking you to try it. I'll give you various cases. See, if you want, you can take vector A like this, take vector B like this, try it out. Or you can take vector A like this, take vector B like this, try it out. Or you can take vector A like this, vector B like this, try it out. Try it out in all possible cases. That is where you gain confidence. Otherwise, you take up very simple cases, then you will tend to believe that parallelogram law of additional vectors will work only in those cases, but not in other cases. But that's not the case. So be very liberal the way you take the vectors. Once you finish with all the three trials, in your dashboard, there will be a thumbs up symbol as a reaction or as a mode of communication. Just indicate with that symbol. Or in the chat box, you can type in a D, D for done. You don't have to type in even that entire word, just D for done, and that will be sufficient. But you have to be very sincere to yourself. Forget about me. You have to be sincere to yourself because if you no, be very casual and don't do the work, then you'll be the first one to lose out. Are you finished or you have any doubt? Sir, finished. Finished. Okay. So, Rakshita is finished. Abdullah is finished. We'll wait for Prithviraj. Prithviraj, any problem or you are able to proceed with that? Sir, I'm doing just one minute. Yeah, but, but you are able to do it, right? You are not getting oh, stuck yes, up. Sir. Yes, sir. Right, right, right. Fine, fine. So what we saw now, yeah. yeah. So what we saw now was parallelogram law of addition of vectors. And that was a graphical method. But graphical methods, they are sometimes not very convenient. You know why? Suppose, suppose there is one vector in this direction. And this vector represents a distance of... Right. And... Uh, 
if you want to add to this vector another vector which is just of length 1 meter then how will you add it if this length is 20 meters then how will you be representing 1 meter just a small distance like this this is 1 and this is 20 times 1 right so is it even convenient to complete a parallelogram like this or even if i take the second vector like this this is 1 meter that's it. and this is 20 meters is it even convenient to complete a parallelogram no sir no right and in two in two dimensions when you can see the vectors it is giving you the answer remember i told you that don't take the vectors like this one vector like this and one vector like this because you won't be able to complete a parallelogram or take no, don't take one vector like this and another vector like this because you won't be able to complete a parallelogram so using graphical method to get the resultant of two vectors is good in its own way because it's a nice intuitive approach just by looking at it you get a feel of in which direction the vector is going to be and so on and so forth so that is good but you know what is the best approach the best approach is always an algebraic approach where you have an equation you plug in the values and you get the answer the resultant of addition of two vectors is given by and i'm giving you directly the formula only for today's demo class tomorrow we'll prove it as of now we'll just believe in that formula and we'll see what we can do with that the resultant of addition of two vectors is given by root of you take the magnitude of the first vector square it take the magnitude of the second vector square it and 2 a b cos of the angle between the two vectors this is how the magnitude of the resultant vector is given. Did you understand the equation? And let us be clear about it. I did not even derive it. I did not prove it till now. We are just having faith in that equation and we'll see what we can understand from this equation. In the later class, we'll prove it. There is a proof for everything in physics. Don't worry about that. Okay. So if you want to represent this is vector a why why should i take even a vector a like this let me call this as vector this is vector b then you draw a line parallel to a let me draw a line parallel to a like this this is a line parallel to a and this is a line parallel to b and these two lines meet at a point and therefore i'll indicate the result this is the result so here this is vector a this one is the magnitude of vector b. The theta that you see here is between angle, I mean vector a and vector. B. This is theta. But remember, the above equation doesn't give you the complete picture because complete picture is both magnitude and direction. And the above equation gives you only the magnitude. We'll worry about the direction later on. For today's class, let us concentrate on the magnitude. So is the formula understood? Right. Now, let us look at the application of this formula. Case 1. Suppose there is one vector of magnitude 3 units, another vector of magnitude 2 units, and the angle between these two vectors is 60 degrees. Can you tell me what will be the value of resultant of addition of these two vectors? It's very simple. I have already given you the formula. You just have to plug in the values, do that little bit of mathematics and tell me the answer. Uh, sir, I have a doubt. Yeah. So in one of the formula, the last part cos theta, like should we directly put 60 degrees or uh, is there any other meaning to cos? No, 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 no. Achha, are you familiar with sin theta, cos theta, tan theta kind of things in trigonometry? Yes, sir. That's it. You just have to plug in the value of cos of 60. So it will oh, be oh. like root of a square plus b square 
प्लस टू इंटू ए इंटू बी इंटू कॉस ऑफ सिक्सटी दैट्स हाउ मच इज द वैल्यू ऑफ कॉस सिक्सटी डज एनी वन रिमेम्बर दैट कॉस सिक्सटी इज वन बाइट करेक्ट सो थ्री थ्री जन नाइन प्लस टू टू जो फोर प्लस कॉस सिक्सटी विल बी वन बाई टू दैट वन बाई टू विल गेट कैंसिल विद दिस टू हि सो वॉट इज लेफ्ट इज थ्री टू दिस सिक्स सो सिक्स प्लस फोर टेन टेन एंड नाइन नाइन दिस इज द मैग्निट्यूड ऑफ द रिजल्टेंट ऑफ एडिशन ऑफ दीज टू वैक्टर्स क्लियर Right. So let us take up a few more examples like this. Second one. Suppose there is a vector a whose magnitude is four units. Then there is vector b whose magnitude is one unit, and the angle between these two vectors is let us say. Okay, let us take another same thing. Sixty degrees. Just tell me what will be the result. Initially, I'm giving you sums with the repetition so that you get the hang of the formulas. Then we'll do slightly more complicated. Sir, so root of thirty-three. Root of thirty-three. So it will be root of a square sixteen plus b square one plus two into a into b. Into cos sixty. Cos sixty is again one by two. This goes with this sixteen oh, plus twenty one. Right? Yeah. So root of twenty one. The graphical method, sir. We can only find the direction. No, no, no. This is only up to the magnitude. There is a way to find out direction also. And as I told you, we'll come back to that later on. This is only half of the. Sir, what I'm talking about the other one, like where we did uh, diagram. No, uh -huh. no, no. In in diagram, you can get both magnitude and direction. What we do is, suppose this is one vector. You take it exactly of three units. It means you take something like one, two, three, like three inches. Mm -hmm. And suppose there is another vector of two units. Then you take a vector only of two inches. That's it, not three inches. And you carefully take a protractor and see to it that the angle between them is sixty degrees. Then you draw a parallel here, and you draw a parallel here, and whatever resultant you get, this one, the length of this resultant R will be exactly the same number that you get using that formula. Suppose that formula gives you root of twenty one or okay. In this case, okay, I, I didn't fix any other value here. I just said three. Let us say this is vector A, this is vector B. Using that formula, if you solve it, it is root twenty one. You can check it with the calculator. Root twenty one. How much is it? Then take a scale and measure that. That distance will be exactly the same. So graphical method is perfectly fine. Only thing is that you have to take the trouble of measuring exactly sixty degrees, then draw a parallel, then draw a parallel. You make a small mistake in the parallel and it is gone. So graphical method is good to have a rough estimate, but can it give you an accurate value? Definitely yes, it can give you an accurate. Value. Okay, then third example. <clears throat> Suppose there is vector A of magnitude four units, vector B of magnitude three units, and the angle between them is ninety degrees. Then what will be the result? So five. Pardon? Five. five. Correct. Root of a square sixteen, b square nine. Plus two a b cos ninety. Cos ninety is zero. So this entire term is gone. So this is root of sixteen plus nine, root of twenty five, and therefore this is equal to five. 
especially this step r is equal to root of 16 plus 9 does it look familiar to something else that you have learned earlier pythagoras theorem pythagoras theorem yes therefore your pythagoras theorem is not a very great theorem it is only a special case of vector addition in vector addition you put theta is equal to 90 degrees and that vector addition becomes pythagoras theorem but from pythagoras theorem can you put cos theta something else no you can't do that but from vector addition you put theta is equal to 90 and that becomes pythagoras theorem. right write a note there pythagoras theorem is a special case of vector addition pythagoras theorem is a special case of vector addition where theta is equal to 90 degrees okay pythagoras theorem is a special case of vector addition where theta is equal to 90 degrees then let us look at the fourth application do you remember when we were doing the graphical approach of adding vectors i asked you to avoid a situation like this because you won't be able to complete a parallelogram so i avoid this so what will be the theta in this case if two vectors are like this zero like none. zero right yeah zero so now let us add a vector a of magnitude 6 units vector b of magnitude 8 units and theta is zero in diagrammatic approach we could not do that but see if in this equation approach can we do this algebraic approach no sir in algebraic approach also we can't do this so Check we can in like ah, in right in algebraic approach we can do but in graphical method there was a restriction right that yes, is why yes. algebraic approach is always preferred when compared to graphical approach but yes, the sir. question is that why do we even use graphical approach in order to have a initial understanding of solving a problem graphical approach will give you a quick idea as to what is happening then to calculate the details you can further go to mathematical approach yes sir there are certain finer points if you really pay attention to them your physics understanding will become very easy so right so nothing is to do by heart easily ah uh, will it be 10 at that 6636 8 8 plus 64 plus 2 a b oh it cos 0 30 cos 0 is 1 ah okay ah so that third term will also be there it will be 36 plus 64 plus 8 is a 48 48 2 is a 96 96 that will also be there so if you simplify that you will get 1400 okay so what is the moral of the story here if there are two vectors in the same direction then in order to add them it is very easy you just have to join the tail of one vector to the head of the other vector and you'll get the total that's it isn't 6 plus 8 directly 14 that's it so without parallelogram you can actually come let us try out another thing here fifth suppose a is 10 units b is 6 units and the angle between them is 180 degrees then what is the magnitude of the result because this was something that could not be you know solved using that diagram theta is equal to 0 was not solvable theta is equal to 180 also could not be solved. but using equations probably we can do it does anyone remember the value of cos 180 we have studied 180 okay right so i'll give you that value cos 180 degrees is equal to minus 1 cos of 120 degrees is equal to minus 1 by 2 these two things are very important you keep coming across them very frequently so you can just remember this in mathematics class later on whoever is taking mathematics for you there you will understand using that all silver p cups the first quadrant second quadrant third and fourth quadrant how to convert 
cos of one angle to another angle. You will understand all that in mathematics. Presently, you can just do this. <clears throat> So how much will be the answer now? Root of a square hundred plus yeah correct b square six six the thirty six minus okay plus two a b into cos one eighty is minus one. You simplify all that and you'll just get ten minus six that is. So here are two important points. Whenever theta is equal to zero, then you can just add a and b as if they are just scalars. You can directly add them. Whenever theta is equal to one eighty, then you have to do a minus one because ten minus six is four. Right? If theta is not zero or one eighty, then you will have to use your root of a square plus b square plus two ab cos theta and all that, and then you will get the result. Understood? Yes, sir. Yeah. One final question before we close today's class. One final question. Suppose there is a vector a, which has the same magnitude as vector b, and when you add them, the resultant is also found to be of the same magnitude. If that is to be true, then so I'll write it here. If magnitude of a Is equal to magnitude of P is equal to magnitude of R. Then, what can be the angle between A and B? What should be theta? Sixty degree. Sixty. Okay. It's like a. Uh, like check that. Directly use this condition. We know that R is equal to root of A square plus B square plus two A B cos theta. This is what we have got. Now we have to impose this condition. So when everything is equal to each other, you can just call it as a. You can call everything as a, or you can call everything as b, or you can call everything as r. Any one of this. Let us call everything as a. So this is a is equal to root of a square plus b is also same as a. So a square plus b is also same as a. Therefore, two a square cos theta. Once you square it, a square is equal to a square plus a square plus two a square cos theta. This one is gone with this. Therefore, two a square cos theta is equal to this goes to the other side minus a square. Cancel this and this becomes one. Therefore, cos theta is equal to minus of one by two. For what value of theta is cos theta minus one by two? Just a couple of minutes ago, I had told you that twenty degrees. One eighty is minus one. One twenty is minus one by. Two. Therefore, if one vector is like this, another vector is like this, one eighty degrees. Then you draw the parallel like this. The resultant will also turn out to be of the same magnitude as that of A and B. All right. Copy down this. Done.